the speed of light. Empedocles, who dates from approximately 490 to 430 BC, is the earliest person known to have claimed that the speed of light was finite. He argued that light was something in motion, and so therefore must take some time to travel. Based on the theories of Euclid and Ptolemy, Heron of Alexandria, who dates from around 10 to 70 of the current era, argued that the speed of light must be infinite, because distant objects such as stars appear immediately upon opening the eyes, and Ptolemy and Euclid had both argued that light emanated from the eyes and bounced off objects and then returned to the eyes, allowing us to see. The reasoning was that since stars were a very long way away, if light travelled at anything other than an infinite speed, there would be some time delay between opening the eyes and the stars showing up because they were a long way away. That the speed of light was infinite was generally accepted until the 17th century. Galileo believed that the speed of light was finite, and in 1638 he estimated it as being at least ten times the speed of sound. In 1676, the Danish astronomer, Ole Roma, used his measurements of the orbits of the moons of Jupiter to estimate the speed of light. Based on his observations, he calculated the speed of light to be approximately 200,000 kilometres per second. In 1690, the Dutch scientist and mathematician Christian Huygens published his Traite de la Lumière, in which he proposed a wave theory to explain the observed properties of light. Huygens postulated that light travelled as longitudinal waves through a medium called the ether. Huygens' theory, which largely dealt with geometric optics, could not explain all of the properties of light. The ether was believed to behave like a fluid, made up of perfectly elastic particles, and Huygens considered that such a medium could only transmit longitudinal waves, similar in nature to sound waves. Huygens' explanation of refraction depends on light propagating more slowly in more optically dense materials. Newton and the Particle Theory of Light In 1704, Isaac Newton published his treatise on light, Optics, in which he outlined his experiments investigating the nature of light and the deductions he made based on these. Newton proposed that light consisted of a stream of particles, called corpuscles. The corpuscles, according to Newton, obeyed the same laws as other masses, and he was able to explain many of the properties of light using his laws of motion and gravity. Part of Newton's particle theory of light was his explanation of the refraction of a beam of light as it passes from one transparent medium to another. Newton thought that this was due to gravitational interactions between the corpuscles and the particles making up the two substances. For example, when light travels from a less dense medium to a more dense medium at an angle, there is a greater mass on one side of the beam than on the other. This results in a net gravitational force causing the corpuscles to accelerate and thus the beam to deflect at the interface between the two materials. While light is travelling through a uniform medium the net gravitational force on the corpuscles would be zero. Therefore, the light would travel in a straight line. Different colours of light, according to Newton, were due to corpuscles having different masses. Using this theory, Newton was able to explain his observations of the splitting of white light into a spectrum by a prism and the recombination of white light by a second prism. Newton's particle theory of light was generally accepted but not unchallenged throughout the 18th century. The wave theory had a number of problems, amongst which was, as Newton pointed out, there was no evidence for the ether. Newton believed that the existence of an ether was not in keeping with the operation of the solar system, as any ether would have produced a drag on the planets and other orbiting bodies. The wave theory could also not account for the observation of birefringence, notable especially in calcite, where light is refracted differently along different crystal axes, producing a double image. And you can see in the picture that the image of the graph paper as seen through the calcite ROM is double 
So the light is split into two separate images when it travels through materials such as calcite, and this is called birefringence. In 1803, in a speech later published, Thomas Young detailed his double-slit diffraction experiment. This experiment was crucial for the wave theory as the results could only be explained in terms of light behaving as a wave. Diffraction from a single source had been described by Francesco M. Grimaldi in his book Physico Mathesis de Luminae, published in 1666. Newton was aware of this work and included an explanation of the phenomenon based on his particle theory of light in his work Optics. The double diffraction experiment carried out by Young, however, could only be explained in terms of Huygens' wave theory of light. In single slit diffraction, the beam of light is shone through a small hole or slit in an opaque screen. This produces a pattern with a single central bright spot with smaller maximums on either side, and you can see above there is an image of a single slit diffraction pattern, and you have a single central bright spot and two smaller bright spots on either side which can be difficult to see. When Young placed a second screen in front of the first, the second screen having two small holes close together, he produced a pattern similar to the one above, in which the central bright spot and subsidiary bright spots are still present, but they are divided into a number of maxima and minima. This pattern is also seen in water waves, and you can see the pattern here produced by two wave sources when the waves from those two sources interfere and you have areas where the waves reinforce one another and areas where the waves cancel each other out. And Young had already demonstrated this in water. The waves from the two slits, or in Young's case pinholes, were causing an identical interference pattern to that which he had previously observed in water. These observations by Young agreed well with Huygens' postulate that waves propagate as a series of spherical wavelets produced at each point along a wave front. You can see in the diagram that there is interference between the wavelets bending around each side of the single slit and again around each side of the double slits. The wave front itself was the product of the constructive and destructive interference of the individual point sources. Leon Foucault. In 1850, Foucault set out to test Newton's particle theory of light. He used a small steam engine to rapidly spin a mirror from which a beam of light was reflected onto another mirror nine meters away. By the time the beam returned from the fixed mirror, the rotating mirror had moved by a small amount, meaning that the beam was deflected by a small amount. Using this apparatus, Foucault measured the speed of light in air to be 299,796 kilometers per second. Foucault then repeated the experiment, this time with a three meter long tube of water in the light path. After traveling through the water-filled tube, the light was deflected further than when it had traveled through the air. The fact that the light was deflected further after having passed through the water indicates that the speed of light in the water was slower than it was in the air. Transverse waves. In 1821, Augustine Jean Fresnel demonstrated mathematically that polarization of light could only be explained if light consisted of transverse waves. Fresnel was able to explain the birefringence of calcite in terms of the polarization vibration direction of transverse light waves. The particle theory of Newton was finally abandoned. Physicists assumed that light waves, as with other wave types, required a medium for propagation, in the case of light permeating all of space. A transverse wave, it was thought, would require a propagating medium to behave as a solid, as opposed to a gas or a fluid, and be many times more rigid than steel but still not affect the orbits of astronomical bodies. Michael Faraday. In 1845, Faraday observed that the plane of polarization of light is rotated by a magnetic field, indicating that light was related to electromagnetism. In 1847, 
Faraday suggested that light was an electromagnetic wave and could propagate in the absence of a medium. James Clerk Maxwell. In 1862, Maxwell discovered that self-propagating electromagnetic waves travelled through space at a constant speed, equal to the speed of light, and he concluded from this that light was a form of electromagnetic radiation. In his 1864 paper, A Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field, Maxwell stated that the agreement of the results seems to show that light and magnetism are affectations of the same substance, and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. Maxwell went on to publish a treatise on electricity and magnetism in 1873, in which he elaborated a set of equations which together provided a full mathematical description of the behaviour of electric and magnetic fields. Maxwell believed that light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation required a medium through which to propagate. Heinrich Hertz. Between 1886 and 1889, Hertz carried out a series of experiments that confirmed Maxwell's theory. Hertz generated and detected radio waves in the laboratory and showed that these waves had similar properties to visible light, such as reflection, refraction, diffraction, and interference. Thank you for watching.